Bible says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding a natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, with the book of James, it's a very interesting book of the Bible. It's a book where a lot of people will get different ideas. Well, they'll teach a lot of false doctrine, or they'll teach a lot of strange doctrine. But if we get the context of James, go to verse 4 here in chapter 1. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The whole book of James is written for you to be perfect. He doesn't want you to be this shallow Christian. He doesn't want you to just get saved and then do nothing with your life. Never do any works for God. Never do anything for God. No, he wants you to be perfect. And that's the whole goal of the book of James is he's trying to perfect you. He's trying to perfect your faith. He's trying to show you ways to grow in the Lord. And we see he's saying, look, just because you're saved isn't anything special. If you just sit here and just hear the words of God preached every single time and you never do any of the work, I mean, nothing's going to happen. You're going to be a forgetful hearer of even what you heard. You've got to do the work in order to uh, grow and to be perfect unto the Lord. Flip over to one chapter. Go to James chapter 2. Look at verse 19. The Bible reads, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Now, what James is trying to teach in James chapter 1 and 2, through this whole chapter, is that you need to do some works. If you're a Christian, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not supposed to just live our lives for ourselves. We're supposed to do work for God. We're supposed to do work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he's getting these Christians who are so lazy, who are slothful, who are not doing the work of God, he's trying to give them a kick in the pants by saying, look, you need to go do some work. But of course today, all the false teachers love this passage of Scripture. They try to teach, this doesn't prove that faith alone saves, but you have to do works to get saved too. But the Bible is super clear that we're saved by faith alone. And you know, you take these modern versions, and they make it even far worse. Look there at verse 24. I'll read for you what the uh, NIV says in verse 24. It says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. So they take it and they twist the words of, of verse 24 to say something completely different. Because some people would say, well, verse 24 it sounds like it's saying that Abraham was saved by not just his faith, but also his works. See then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. But we've got to understand, if the Bible has another clear scripture that's saying what seems to be the opposite, we're probably interpreting the Bible wrong. If we say that we believe that Jesus Christ gave us this word, and man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, then maybe we're misinterpreting the context of this passage. I'll read for you from Galatians 2. The Bible says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of, Jesus, of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now if you take just both of those verses by themselves and isolated them, it would kind of look like maybe they're contradicting one another. Or maybe they're saying different things. You're saying, well, how does that make any sense? Well, the Bible makes it clear that we are saved by faith. Let me give you a couple other verses. I'll just read you for them, read them to you. In Romans 3, the Bible says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, without the deeds of the law. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. 
So the Bible's super clear that in order to go to heaven, we're saved, we're justified in the sight of God by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, by our faith, by putting all our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That couldn't be any clearer. So then what is James chapter 2 teaching here? Well, let's go back and look at verse 21. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? So in some way, Abraham was justified by his works. That's very clear what the passage is saying. What was the work that he did? It says, when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now today is Father's Day. And we know what could be harder for a father to do than to offer his own son on the altar. His only son. We see how much love the father has for us and the fact that you know he gave his only begotten son on the cross to die for us. But we see, in my opinion, this is probably the greatest work highlighted in the Bible done by man. Is the fact that Abraham did exactly what, you know, a symbol, an example of what God was going to do by giving Jesus Christ. Abraham was willing to give his only begotten son, Isaac, on the altar. So then in some way, Abraham was justified. But was Abraham justified for salvation? No, of course not. So then what way was he justified? Look at verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So now we see what's happening here. Abraham's faith was perfected by this work that he did. So if you never do any big works for God, you're not going to have a perfect and complete faith. You might have a small faith that got you saved. You put all of it on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want that faith to grow, if you want to have a perfect faith, if you want to have a big faith, we have to do the works of God, just like Abraham. Amen. Abraham had a perfect faith because he said, I don't care if it's the hardest thing, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to even offer my son on the altar. Talk about one of the hardest works you could ever even imagine. Look at verse 23. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. I'm sorry, verse 22. Look at verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, we don't need to pass over verse 23, because I believe it's the key to understanding verse 24. Look at the first part. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now that jives perfectly with all the other verses that I showed you. How that we're justified by faith in the sight of God. How that we're saved by our faith. But then it has a colon, and it says, and. So this is something additional. This is something also. This is something extra. And he was called the friend of God. Why was Abraham called the friend of God? Because he had a perfect faith. Because he offered Isaac on the altar. If Abraham had never offered Isaac on the altar, he wouldn't have been known as this great friend of God, as this father of the faith, as this man that had perfect faith. So then look at verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Saying what? Saying after you get saved, it's not like your life's over. It's not like there's nothing to do. It's not like there's no work to be done. You see how with Abraham's work, he was justified to be called the friend of God. We see he wasn't just justified by his faith alone. He wasn't justified the fact that he was saved. No, God's also going to judge our works. God's also going to judge how we live our life. And the only way that we're going to be justified to be called the friend of God is if we do his works. Amen. So we see it's very clear how he was justified. It's not talking about salvation. It's not talking about eternal life. It's not talking about going to heaven or hell. It said very clearly that Abraham believed God and it was imputed him for righteousness. That's how he was saved. And God's not the author of confusion. God makes the Bible super clear. If you think you're maybe, you know, confused about two verses, why don't you get the full context and let the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth? Go to uh, James chapter 4 if you would. So in Romans chapter 4, I'll read for you, the Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the Bible makes it super clear that even though Abraham was this great man of faith, did many works for the Lord, even did what's probably arguably the greatest work ever, it had nothing to do with him going to heaven. Zero. 
No, he couldn't, he couldn't boast before God. He couldn't say that God is saved. No, it's by his faith that he was saved. And it's by our faith that we're saved. And I just want to make that super clear before we get into the sermon. Because, you know, some people would say, well, you know, when you teach a hardcore, uh, we got to go to work, we got to do some works. They're thinking, are you teaching that for salvation? Absolutely not. Right. We need to do good works. It has nothing to do with being saved. I like to say this when I go out soul winning, and I'm talking to somebody at the door, and I'm trying to explain this. I say, now if I walk across the street, and I follow all of those person's rules, would that make me their son? And they're like, well, no. That wouldn't make you their son. That doesn't make any sense. And I say, exactly. What do I have to do to be son? And they say, be born. Yeah, we must be born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, we should follow our parents' rules. Of course, we should do the things that we should... We should do the works that our parents have set before us. But it has nothing to do with whether or not you're a son. Just as silly as that example is, it would be for someone to say that we're justified by our works. To be saved. Now, of course, we are justified by our works in another way. Of getting rewards, of God being pleased with us. Look at James 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God of God. Now turn to John chapter 15. This is an important point. The Bible makes it clear that just because you're saved doesn't automatically make you this great friend of God. I mean, if you get saved and then you just go back into the world and you're just living in the world, you're actually at enmity with God in that moment. You're not, you know, uh, a partaker of his, his fellowship. You're not, you know, maybe God's going to withdraw his blessings from your life. We see how we live our lives is going to determine God you know, blessing in our lives. Go to John chapter 15 and look at verse uh, 14. The Bible says, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Wow, that's, that's not something that most churches teach today. You're my friends if you do what? When I commanded you. So is that just, oh, I'm automatically his friend because I'm saved. Isn't that what most, you know, modern liberal churches will teach today? That every, I mean, they'll teach unsaved people are God's friend. Right. No, you got to do what he said if you want to be his friend. That's why Abraham was justified to be called the friend of God. Because he did the works. Because he, just, he continued in his faith. He had a perfect faith. So we see that James chapter 2 has a lot of meaning. It has a lot of purpose. But it's not talking about being saved. It's not talking about, hey, you got to do works to be saved or to prove you're saved or if you are saved, it's inevitable you're going to do the works. Of course not. And the title of my sermon today is Use It or Lose It. Use It or Lose It. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 if you would. So I was just trying to lay a little bit of a foundation there before we got to start in the sermon. To, to see, hey, we're not saved by how we live our life. We're not saved by doing the works. We don't have to do some great you know, show of our faith to prove that we're saved. No, we just believe in God and we're saved. It's simple. It's as simple as taking a you know, drink of water, eating a piece of bread, walking through a door, just calling upon the name of the Lord in faith like a child and being saved. Just like Peter when he was in the water and just said, Lord, save me, and immediately stretched forth his hand and he saved him. It wasn't even really the words that matter, was it? He was just like, save me! And he's like, done! Saved! But look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. The Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now this is probably the clearest verse to me to show you could do nothing for God and still be saved. It's saying, look, even if you had done only these wood, hay, and stubble, you just lived it for yourself, he says, all your works are going to be burned up, but at least you're saved. But there's a key thing here. It says uh, in verse 15 in the middle, he shall suffer loss. So, of course, going to heaven is not a bad thing. I don't think anybody's going to be really disappointed that they made it to heaven rather than hell. But it does say that you could get to heaven and still suffer some type of loss. Still be uh, upset that you didn't live for God. Have a realization that, man... I wish I had spent more of my time serving God. I wish I had done more works for God. 
But we see that the whole point of our life after we get saved is to lay up gold, silver, and precious stones. But no other foundation can be laid. We can only do these works if we're saved if we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Revelation chapter 2 if you would. I'll read for you in John chapter 12. The Bible says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. You know, it's an interesting dichotomy as a, as a Christian. You kind of have to make a reversal in your mind from the carnal world. Because the carnal world, they live for today. They have to live for themselves. Because they say, YOLO, you only live once, so I better gratify all the lust of my flesh. I better live for myself completely. But God says as a Christian, we should be willing to give up all of those things. And guess what? We're not gonna we're not gonna end up losing that. We're gonna keep it unto life eternal. We're gonna have something even greater in the future. Look at Revelation chapter two, verse one. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen, repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give, Tea to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we see Jesus Christ is riding under these early churches, and he's saying, hey, y'all are doing a lot of good things here, but you've left the first works. And when you leave the first works of God, when you're not using what the Bible would say, the gospel, because the first works is clearly the gospel. You can see in, in uh, Mark chapter 1, the first thing that Jesus did in his ministry was to preach, repent ye and believe the gospel. What was he doing? He's preaching the gospel. We see what was the first thing that Christ commanded them? To go ye out in all the world and preach the gospel. The first works is so clear that it's preaching the gospel, that it's getting people saved, that it's going out into the highways and hedges and compelling them to come in. But we see if a church, if they're doing everything right, they've got the King James Bible, they're independent, they're fundamental, they got the right doctrine on the wall, I mean, they're doing all these good works, they hate the false doctrine, but then they forsake the soul winning. Look what it says here. It says in verse 5, And I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Flip back one chapter real quick. You say, well, candlestick, what does that mean? Is it they're just not going to have lights in the building? Is he not going to pay their electric bill anymore? No, that's not what it's saying. Look at Revelation 1 verse 20. The Bible says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the Bible's saying he's not going to remove their candlestick and like a figurative candlestick or a literal candlestick. He's saying them as a church. They're not going to be a church unto God anymore. In God's eyes, when they come together, they're no longer a church because they're not preaching the gospel. And I preached a sermon a little while ago about what separates a church from a social club. If you're not preaching the gospel, you've removed yourself from being a church and now you're a social club. Right. And there's yeah. so many churches today, they won't go out and preach the gospel. They won't even walk out the door. They won't even go down the aisle and just talk to the new visitor and try to give them the gospel. Well, God says, look, I'm going to come into you and remove that. Because why? If you don't use the gospel, you're going to lose the gospel. And this is so applicable in every part of our life. We see that the church that refuses to go out and preach the gospel, refuses to go and get their neighbors saved, refuses to go and knock on doors, they're going to lose their place as a church. There's no middle ground. There's no middle way. There's no gray area with God. No, it's black or white. Either you're going out preaching the gospel and you have blessings of God, or you stop going out and preaching the gospel, and He's going to remove even that which you have. He's going to take away all that you have. Go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We see this is something that's so common in all places of the Bible. But it's so important as a church, as anybody that wants to be a part of a church, that you're going out and you're preaching the gospel. That you're keeping the first works. 
And he says, look, I won't do this if you repent. I mean, if you backslide, you start going back, and well, now we're going to just go back soul winning. Now we're not going to have it in the winter. Hey, if they decide to get back on God's plan, he's going to come right back and be with them. He wants these churches to succeed. He wants to help them go out and preach the gospel. But if you just refuse, if you're a wicked and slothful and lazy servant, God's not going to just help you do it. He's not going to make you do it. No, we have free will. Look at Matthew 21, verse uh, 32. The Bible says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent his ser other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto another husbandman, which shall render him the fruits and their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures, The stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. This couldn't be clear that it either use it or you lose it. These guys, they weren't doing anything. In the, they weren't you know, producing the fruit and the vine and the vineyard. He's giving a parable saying, hey, here's some farmers. They're supposed to be producing fruit and they won't do it. And every time I send a servant or I send my son, they're just killing him. They're just lazy. And the Bible says in verse 41, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. It's wicked for a Christian to just refuse to grab soul money. To refuse to get people saved. To refuse to produce fruit. It's wicked. And we see when Jesus Christ in his ministry, towards the end, he's walking and he sees a fig tree. And the fig tree has the figs on it. It doesn't have any figs on it. What does he do? He just grabs the tree, or he touches the tree, and it just withers and dies. And that's what Christ is going to do to all these independent fundamental Baptist churches that refuse to go preach the gospel. Yeah. We see that they're dying and withering and producing no fruit and they're just going to perish. And you know what Christ said in that tree? He said you'll never produce fruit again. He didn't say, well, maybe, okay. No, I think that there's thousands of churches in this country that are dying and withering and perishing. Christ has already moved the candlestick from them and they're never going to produce fruit again. We need new trees to be planted. We need new fig trees to go out to do the works of God. Amen. But those that are doing the works of God, those that are going out to preach the gospel, we should have a clear warning that, hey, if you decide to stop, Christ is going to make sure to take away what you have. You can't go, you can't stop and just be in this middle ground forever. No, you're either going forward or you're going backward. And you're either going to use it or you lose it. In every area of your life. I think to myself whenever I uh, was younger, my parents always made me play piano. I always played the piano. I got lessons. I played it hours a day. I went to all these kinds of recitals. I learned so many songs by heart. I could play all kinds of classical you know, piano. I was very good. And then by about the age of like 14 or 15, I was in a freshman in high school, and my teacher said, you know what, you've, you've learned a lot. You're really good. At this point, I don't feel like you're progressing very much with me as your teacher. I think it would be better for you, you can grow a lot better if you find somebody that's a little bit more professional, a little bit more skilled than I am. And we live in a smaller area, so it was kind of hard. And I just told my mom, can I just please quit? Like, I don't want to play piano anymore. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. It's just because I was a selfish little brat. All I like to do is play video games. I just love to live for myself. And she, she let me quit. She let me stop playing. And I never played the piano again for probably like 10 years. I mean, every once in a while I might just, you know, jam it. But like seriously, never practicing, never really trying to play any songs. And every single song that I'd ever learned was gone. I couldn't play a single one. And I basically had lost everything. Because the only thing I had even worked on was memorizing those, you know, certain classical pieces or having those memorized. I mean, I was basically like starting over. 
Why? Because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Amen. I even know when I was going back to another church uh, back in Texas, they didn't have you know dedicated soul winning. So I just basically had to drag myself and whoever I could take with me. And I took them kicking and screaming. I just, just come with me. I'll buy you lunch. Just come on, let's go. Because I just liked having that silent partner. And when I would go and I'd preach, and there was a time where I, I went, didn't go for like two or three weeks. I can't remember the exact time. It was about two or three weeks where I just hadn't gone in between. And I noticed the first door that I knocked, I wasn't very sharp. I couldn't remember the verses as well. I was kind of stumbling through it. Even somebody that's preached the gospel for a while, if you just stop going, you're gonna, you're dull, your blade's going to get dull. You're going to lose it. You, everything in this life. Don't take anything for granted. I know that uh, before I moved here, I had memorized like 10 chapters of the Bible. And today, if I had to try and quote those 10 chapters, I'd probably fail at a lot of them because I haven't been diligent in continuing to memorize them and continue to repeat them and continuing to quote them. If you don't use it, you will lose it. Everything in your life. You know, they say, well, it's like riding a bike. Yeah, it might be a little bit easier, but that's not a good way to live your life. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And today we think about Father's Day, right? There's so many people today where they grow up in a single parent home or they grow up with just their mom. And I think it's because these fathers, they're not fighting for their families anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you're not paying attention to your wife, if you're not paying attention to your children, if you're not giving them attention and affection and fighting for them, you'll lose it. Because she'll say, well, I'll just find some guy that will provide somewhere else. And she'll just walk away. Now that's a really wicked and, and you know, godless thing for a wife to do. We should never, you know, depart from our spouse or, you know, divorce or anything like that. The Bible says it's very clear that a divorce would be a sin. But we see just in the carnal, you know, heart and what's reality, when a guy's not willing to provide, when he's not sticking around, when he's not giving attention to his kids, the wife starts to depart. She starts to depart in her heart. She starts to depart in her mind. She doesn't want to do these things. And as men, we ought to fight for our family. We ought to fight for our children. We ought to fight for our wives. And even if they don't physically depart, we see a lot of times these families, they spiritually depart. We see these guys, they're not giving their kids the attention of the Bible. They're not teaching them any of the Word of God. They're not teaching them how to go soul winning. They're not teaching them the fundamentals of the faith. You go to these independent fundamental Baptist churches and you talk to the generation that's my age and they don't know any of the Bible. They don't know any of the doctrines of the Bible. They don't know why they're King James only. They don't know why soul winning is important. They're probably not even saying. Why? Because the fathers aren't teaching their children. They're not doing what God's given them. They're not using the role that God gave them as a father. If you don't use the role of your father, it's going to be taken away from you. Right. You know it's going to be replaced with? With the school. It's going to be replaced with the government. It's going to be replaced with this world. Because children are going to find their father figure. Meaning what? They're going to find the person that they look up to. The person that encourages them, that teaches them. Every single person has this. Whether or not it's a physical person or it's just the idea of like the world. Or they'll look to a super, you know, uh, athlete. Or they'll look to a musician. And they look at this person. This person's my role model. Mm. It used to be great when, when I was a kid in school. And you'd have like the fifth, five-year-olds or the six-year-olds first and second graders. And you'd have, who do you want to be when you grow up? It used to be they all said they wanted to be their dad. It used to be, hey, I want to be a fireman like my dad. Hey, I want to be a carpenter like my dad. Hey, I want to be like my dad. He's the greatest person that I know. But I guarantee today, if you ask the five and six and seven year olds of today, a lot of them wouldn't say that. You know. A lot of them would say, I want to be, you know, a professional basketball. I want to be LeBron James. And I want to be, you know, this professional movie actor. I want to be uh, any of these Hollywood celebrities. I want to be Donald Trump. What a horrible thing for a kid to want to desire to be. But if you don't use your role, you're going to lose it. And we see it's important as a father to make sure that we're using our role or we'll lose it to something else. Mm -hmm. Our kids will check out. They won't be interested in us. They won't pay attention to us. Even as the, as the husband to our wives. Go to, uh, go to Matthew 22. Look over there. We'll see the same thing. It says in Matthew 22, verse 9, Go ye therefore to the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. We see that it's our job as a Christian to go out and preach the gospel. Go to uh, 
2 Samuel 18, if you would. 2 Samuel 18. I'll read for you a couple other places. In Matthew 28, the Bible says, Go ye therefore and all the Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We see that the Bible makes it clear we need to go out and preach the gospel. And these churches that just refuse to do it, you say, well, if the scripture is so clear, I mean, if there's all these places and they're well known verses, what are these churches doing to kind of fill that void? What they often do is they're raising money to send out missionaries. To send out these people. And that's what they think is the Great Commission. Is to just pile a bunch of money together and just send some guy out to Africa or some you know, foreign country and that guy is going to get the gospel out. But you know, they'll get up. And I've been in so, I've been in so many services where they're singing this song. Uh, I don't know the name of it. But it was like, just one more soul. And the whole song's about like, just one more soul coming down the aisle and it's all worth it. My whole life's worth it, and everything I've ever done, and all the work I did this week, it's worth it if we just have one more soul. But they're not willing to just walk across the street and talk to the guy at the first door and give him the gospel. They'll get on their knees, and they'll pray, and they'll sing all these songs, and they'll say, just one more soul. It's just so important. But they can't even just walk across the street and talk to one person and give them the gospel. It's so ridiculous. It's so much hypocrisy. And of course we shouldn't even be satisfied with just one more soul. That's stupid. The Bible says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Not sheaf. Not one. No, sheaves. Why? Because anybody that goes out and goes soul winning, anybody that goes out and preaches the gospel, you can tell you're going to get more than one person saved. Right. If you're preaching the gospel faithful, people are going to get saved because the gospel has power. Amen. There's no other book that has power like this book. And you say there's 7 billion people in the world. Why are you so worried about that one soul? That just seems stupid. That seems foolish. How are you going to get 7 billion people saved if a church of 500 people is just hoping one person gets saved a week? That sounds really desperate. That sounds really ridiculous. I'm not going to go through this example. Pastor Anderson preaches a few times. But we see if one person, one soul winner got just one person saved a year, and then you go to the next year and those two people got somebody saved and you keep multiplying and growing. So with a person that gets saved wins one, one person all, as well. So imagine I was saved and I got Brother Caleb saved. One year. Then the second year, Caleb got uh, Brandon saved, and I got Brother Charlie saved. Now we have four people saved. And you keep going by that rate, by the 33rd year, you would have 8.5 billion people saved. Now, of course, we're not going to get the whole world saved, but it just goes to show in 30 years, you could hypothetically get every person saved. Right. And when you have 6,000 churches with hundreds of people in them, we're not starting from one person. Yep. But we see that they're not churches. Why? Because they're not using the gospel, so they lost it. And that's why these independent fundamental Baptist churches, they're mixed up on the gospel. They're mixed up on repent of your sins. They're mixed up on lordship salvation. They're mixed up on dispensationalism. They're mixed up on all this junk because they're not preaching the gospel. If the person in the pew is going out and clearly getting somebody saved, he's not going to get confused when the guy gets up there and preaches you know, a false gospel or a false salvation. He knows what it is. He uses it. Yeah. But we see the problem today, and I have three, three short points is that what I call it hand, foot, mouth disease. That's the problem that these people have. You know, it's kind of like a play on words, but it's like the hand, foot, and mouth disease. You know, and I think a lot of them, they're, they pretty much, when it comes to the hands of preaching the gospel, they're, they're pretty good. They're friendly. You go to these churches, these people are friendly for the most part. They like to welcome people. They, they're willing to, to give them a, a track in many cases even. You know, there's a lot of churches that do what's called visitation, where they'll go and they'll hand somebody a track. But then the second point is a foot. Now this is where a lot of, you get a big separation from uh, these churches. So pretty much every independent Bible Baptist church, I believe if you walked in the door, they will talk to you, they'll give you some information about the church, they'll hand you some information. I mean, that's probably just a given, right? That's not really where the disease is starting. It might spread all the way to that point, but usually most of them will do the hand. But when it comes to the foot, that's where there's a big division already. Go to 2 Samuel 18, look at verse 9, where I had you turn. I'm sorry, look at verse uh, 21. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, 
yet again to Joab, but howsoever let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever said he, Let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate into the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Me thinking the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man, and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Job sent this king's servant, and me thy servant, and I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. So we see here in this story, we see uh, in this conflict, there was a conflict between David and his son Absalom. And Absalom was trying to take the kingdom. He had set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, and, and David had fled. And then there was this war where Joab was going out to try and defeat Absalom. And it comes that they end up do killing Absalom and, and defeating the bat. They kind of win the battle. There wasn't really a lot of bloodshed, but they just kind of defeated the leader of that movement, Absalom. And so this guy, Cushai, he, he really just wants to be the one that runs. But he's not that interested in the tidings. He doesn't care that he doesn't have any tidings. He just wants to run. He just wants to go and do the running. But then when he gets there, he has nothing to say. And the Bible says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And we see even from the carnal mind, or it's not necessarily the carnal mind, but this, this is obviously also true in the carnal mind, that when somebody comes to your door and knocks on it or gives you some information, they probably have something to say. I mean, that just seems obvious. Look at verse 25. There is tidings in his mouth. Look at verse 27. And cometh with good tidings. He's expecting this guy that's coming to tell him something. To give him some kind of information. And wouldn't you expect for a Christian, if he comes and knocks on your door, to probably tell you something? But we see a lot of these churches, all they do is live, you know, put a little door hanger. Or put a little visitation on the door. And they just run away scared. And we see that David says, like, turn aside. He's like, I'm not interested in this guy. And he let the other guy give him the news. You know, the church that I was going to, they had no soul winning, but they did have a once a year visitation, what they called Friend Day, where they just got the whole church together to meet on a Saturday and gave them all these door hangers, and they just went and just put a door hanger and they just ran away. I mean, that's not preaching the gospel. That's not using the gospel. And God doesn't look down at that and say, well, that's good. No, because they have to preach the gospel too. So the mouth is usually where we have the final point. I would say most of these churches that got the hand, most of these churches, and then there's a small number of churches that at least go out and do something. Mm -hmm. But then we see they've got the mouth disease. Right. The mouth is really where the problem is. Go to, uh, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, it says, And then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. When Peter was going to to preach the gospel to a group of Gentiles for the first time, the Bible makes a clear mention to say he opened his mouth. He came, he used his feet, but guess what? He then had to open his mouth to preach the gospel. We see in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto Jesus. We need to always be those that would be willing to open our mouths to preach the gospel. And Matthew 5, 2, it says, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus Christ opened his mouth. 2 Corinthians 6.11, the Bible says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, and our heart is enlarged. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll look at one other example. So here we have the famous scripture about the whole armor of God. Look at verse 13. Wherefore take you the whole armor of God, Look at verse 14. We have our loins girt about with truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Look at verse 15. Your feet shod with the preparation. 
So we have the feet. We have the people going out. Look at verse 16. Taking the shield of faith. 17, having the helmet of salvation. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We should pray with all prayer and supplication. But look at verse 19. So now as for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. We see that it's so important. Look at verse 20. For I am a bastard in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It's a command of God for us to go out and to preach the gospel. Not to just put a door flare, not just put a hanger. And I was talking to a young man that was pretty interested in things of God, I thought. I took him to lunch. I was trying to get him to go soul winning with me. And I said, look, I go on Saturdays. I would love you to come. You don't have to say anything. Just be my silent partner. Come with me. Well, I kind of see myself as this lifestyle evangelist. You know, this person that just, you know, by how I live my life, that other people are going to want to come to me, and then I can talk to them, and I can give them. No, that's not what the Bible says. We need to have the hand and the feet and the mouth. We need to go out and be friendly and then just preach the people the gospel. And you know what? I find it ten times harder to get someone saved that I know than that I don't know. Right. So it seems really foolish to say, well, let's start with the people that we know. Because many times, you know, if the person already knows you, they don't take you as serious or they don't see, you know, the power of God. The Bible says a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. We see that there's something to be said about a guy that just comes up to you and with boldness preaches you the gospel. Just opens his mouth boldly. I have good news to bring to you. And I was thinking about an example. Imagine that there was a farm. And we had, this guy had two sections of his farm. And in this first section, he planted a bunch of trees. And they sprouted up. They sprouted up real easy. He didn't even have to put any water on them. They're real straight looking. They're real pretty. They're real nice. I mean, these trees have got it together. I mean, you didn't have, he hardly had to put any work into them. But then on the other side of the section of this field, these trees struggled to sprout, you know, to, to sprout, to come out of the ground. He had to put a little bit of extra effort in them. And when they come out, they were a little crooked. So then he had to you know, tie them down and, and embrace them and help them kind of grow a little bit straighter. And he had to give them more water because it looked like they were withering a little bit. But then when it came to harvest, all these difficult trees that he had to put all this work in, they produced the apples. They produced the fruit. And these trees that looked so nice, they brought it up real easy, there was all this maintenance, there was no fruit on them. It would just be immediately obvious to every single person that he's just going to destroy this one field and plant it with the, the trees that actually produce the fruit. Even though it was more work, even though it wasn't as perfect. And that's the same way God looks at the Christians today. When he was looking at the churches, if they had something a little off or a little wrong, he wasn't threatening to take away their church. But if they had the gospel wrong, he was going to take away their church. And it just makes complete sense that when you're growing anything or you're producing fruit, if it's not producing the fruit, if it's not getting to the end goal, does any of the other stuff matter? I mean, I've been to churches where, man, they've got the King James Bible, they're set apart, they're tithing, they have a fancy building, they're singing praises, they hold all these conferences and fellowship, they have, you know, people serving in all kinds of, you know, offices in the church. Whether, I don't think it's right, but they had a nursery, they have a choir, you know, they have all these people playing the piano and the organ, all these instruments, they have this beautiful choir. I mean, they're holding all these meetings, they have a prayer meeting, they have Sunday school, they're doing all these works. But then they're not preaching the gospel. They have the, they didn't have to they have all these things right. And we see the church at Ephesus, man, it was doing all these good things. It was doing all these right things, but it had the gospel wrong. That's the thing that the church should make sure. Hey, no matter what else is happening, let's get the gospel right first. That's the most important thing. And you know, when a church maybe starts out, it might not have everything right just at the very beginning. It may struggle, but as long as it's producing fruit. God's going to use that tree. God's going to help that tree grow. And he's got that tree, you know, grow into even a bigger tree and to produce more fruit. And he's going to purge it. Just like the Christian life. God doesn't use perfect Christians to go out soul winning and win people to Christ. No. He wants to continue to purge you and clean you up and make you, a, you know, a cleaner vessel so that when you go out and preach the gospel, you can be used more effectively. Amen. But the person that's not, you know, just being a forgetful hearer, that's not going out and doing the work, they're going to lose everything that they have. And I think there's probably a lot of grace of God when it comes to people that get saved, that maybe they don't immediately are soul winning and doing all the right things, that He's long suffering towards them. But those that actually have the truth, those that actually know soul winning, those that have actually gone out and won souls, 
If they decide to get out of church, if they decide to backslide, if they decide to stop doing the works of God, we should be greatly fearing of God that He would come and take all the things out of our life. That He would destroy even our physical life on this earth. Why? He did it to the fig tree. He did it to the Jews. He did it to all the people that would just refuse to do His work. He took away the church. And how much more? You know, go to Romans chapter 2. Go to Romans chapter 2 if you would. How much more should we, you know, that are saved and have done the right things and have been given all this knowledge, make sure that we continue in the things of God. Look at uh, verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Sounds familiar, huh? Sounds exactly like James chapter 1 was saying. Look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, and their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing us, excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So we see God's going to judge us by our works. And we should not just be uh, just hearers of the law, but we need to be doers also. Why? So that when we stand there, we don't suffer loss. So we stand there, God's not, you know, judging us, and we have nothing to show for it. Go to Romans chapter 11 now. We'll kind of close there. The Bible says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will we speak with His people. The Bible says, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. The Bible talks about the, the Christian life as being a race that we need to run. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. But look at Romans 11, verse 18. It says, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches... Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. What is he saying? He's saying, look, the Jews, they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Jesus Christ. And they were, you know, broken off as it were. They were no longer going to be this, this nation that God was shining his light on. He was going to give it to a new nation, to a nation that was bringing forth the fruits thereof. But a nation that wasn't really a nation in the sense that it was gathered under one place. It's like Russia or China. It's a heavenly nation. It's a nation made up of all believers. But he's saying, you know, we shouldn't just be boasting ourselves against the Jews and saying, well, I know that he took it away from the Jews, but he'll never take it away from us. You know, we can't lose it. No, he says, look, they lost it because of their unbelief, and you're standing in faith, but be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. If we reject the gospel too, if we stop going out and preaching the gospel, if we stop fulfilling the works of God, God will take it away from us too. So we need to be careful as men. And I think as men, you know, when I think about Father's Day, men have been given a lot of control in their family. I mean, they are the ones that are to lead their wives. They're the ones that are supposed to train up their children. The Bible says train up a child in the ways you go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's the man's responsibility to keep things in place, to not lose them. And we need to be careful in our churches that we don't lose the gospel so that we don't lose our church. We need to be careful to not lose our, our wives, to not lose our children. Why? Because we need to use it. We need to be the person that's taking the lead. We need to be an example under the, under the flock, unto the, the other believers, in our house. We want our children to look at us and be like, I want to be like Dad. Look at the example he's setting for. Look at him going out soul winning. It's so important. I love taking my children soul winning when they're one in three. And my three-year-old, he's always like, are we going to go soul winning, Dad? Are we going to go soul winning? I can't wait to go soul winning. He loves to go soul winning. He calls me the soul winning dad. And that's not to lift myself up or say that I'm some special person. Anybody can be a soul winner. Anybody can go out and do it. It just shows you that even at a young age, they're soaking everything up. They're, they're, they're getting it all in their mind. It's so important to use the gospel so that we don't lose it. So that we teach our children to go out and preach the gospel. It's not just about me. It's not just, how many people can I get saved? 
I'm just going to spend all my time only thinking about myself. Mm -hmm. No, it's also important for me to get other people to go out soul winning. To get my children to go out soul winning. That I teach and raise a godly generation after me. So that we don't lose that too. We see that the, the generations that are older than us, they're losing it. Because they're not going out and preaching the gospel. It's super clear. I mean, is soul winning something that's just happened across this whole nation by every church? Of course not. That's why they're losing the church. That's why they're losing the doctrine. That's why they don't have the blessing of God in their church. Mm-hmm. Because they're not using it. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. In every area of your life. If you don't use your skills, if you don't use the gospel, if you don't use the, the responsibilities that God has given unto you as a man. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, God, so much for your clear word. Thank you for uh, dying on the cross and giving us the free gift of eternal life so that we could then go out and preach the same gospel. And I thank you that you know our labor is not in vain, but that you reward us according to us, our work. I pray that we would not be slothful and lazy and wicked, but that we would go out and do the work so that we could never lose it. And I pray that you would bless every person in this church that would go out and do the works, that you'd be with them, that you'd fill them with your spirit, that we'd go out in might. And I pray that we would not only just the things that you've given us spiritually, but even in a carnal sense, our families and our children, that we would not just forget them or forsake them, that we'd also use all the responsibilities that you've given us so that we would lose nothing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.